the sound of Mahler's orchestra is, is unique uh, because he added layers to the orchestration. Um, he, uh, for example, wanted to depict military bands, and so that meant trumpets off stage, it meant trombones off stage, horns off stage, as in the first and second symphonies. Um, it meant uh, the addition of various other instruments like the euphonium, um, which is used in the seventh symphony. Sometimes a whole bank of horns, eight horns. Sometimes, as in the first symphony, he even gets all the horns to stand up uh, near the end. Sometimes he adds an extra trombone when he, when he feels he wants it at the end of the first symphony. And he just decided to do that. And I think probably as an opera conductor, work, working in an opera company where they would have had all these extra instruments, he probably thought he might as well use them. But uh, I think also there's the feeling that um, with Mahler, um, there's a famous conversation that he had with Sibelius, where Sibelius talked about the, um, his own view of the symphony, and Mahler's response was uh, that, in his view, the symphony should embrace the whole world. So that could be cowbells who were used in the orchestra. It could be uh, little children's nursery rhymes played uh, very high on the double bass in a way no one had ever used the double bass before. It could be these sounds of these military band effects that even come in um, in the uh, in the Ninth Symphony. Interestingly, though, in the Ninth Symphony, um, the orchestra is not uh, as large as it is in um, in some of the previous works. So, uh, although we've still got um, we've still got two harps, we've still got uh, you know a huge wind section and and a, and a fairly substantial brass section, we don't have all the extra off-stage gizmos that we've um, that we've had before. We don't have um, Celesta, for instance, which um, we've uh, uh, we've had before, um, and uh, what he d what he's done in in one sense is pair the orchestra uh, back, and um, it's as if he c he's after all the bombast of the early years, especially the, the eighth symphony, which is symphony of a thousand, which of course is huge, I mean, it's enormous, and such. Uh, I mean, apart from the subject matter, which is so deeply moving, it's very great fun to, to actually perform it. But with the Ninth Symphony, he, um, it's as if he strips all that away and gets down to the core message, like what's the narrative that I want to depict? What do I want to, uh, to say at this particular point? He quotes a waltz by Johann Strauss uh, that was written to open uh, the Vienna Music Verein and um, the Singverein in um, 1870. And uh, this uh, waltz is all about celebrating life. And uh, he quotes some of his own works uh, in the last movement. And so um, there's this feeling of farewell. And he doesn't f say farewell, um, he doesn't end bombastically, he doesn't begin bombastically. Um, but b between these two huge adagio, more or less adagio um, bookends, the first movement and the, and the last movement have these grandiose and quicker moments, of course. Uh, but the second and third movements are particularly um, uh, vivacious. I mean, the third movement, uh, the rondo, is uh, dedicated to my friends uh, in Apollo, the, the god of music, the god of dance, the god of arts, and so on, um, who lives on Mount Olympus, anyone who lives on Mount Olympus. And so he, um, he says these farewells. It's not almost, almost as though um, he says farewell to other musicians or to music itself, because he's, he just sort of s says, well, I'm just done with it, it seems, when the movement's just finished. There's a comical ending to the second movement, uh, but the third movement has this um, sort of declamatory, almost door-slamming effect, similar in a way to Tchaikovsky's Pathetic Symphony that, Tchaik that um, uh, Mahler knew um, the symphony, although he had spoken disparagingly of it ten years before, but he knew the effect of the third movement being um, boisterous and then um, suddenly uh, a door almost slamming and the party ending before plunging into this um, into this extraordinary last movement. And the last movement is really so many different things. Uh, listening to different people talk about it, it it's difficult to say um, with any absolute certainty what it is other than um, a farewell that uh, quotes other works of his, um, a farewell that's uh, clearly a loving life and that um, he's, um, he's signing off with some reluctance. And of course, um, we look at it now knowing that he died without hearing the piece, but um, what people didn't know so much at the time was that actually, well, he's written almost another symphony after this, 
which he hadn't orchestrated. So it's very easy to look at the composer's life and say, well, you know, it is a farewell. It's uh, a heart-wrenching so long and goodbye. And I have my private feelings about it, which almost feels inappropriate to share because um, I love it so much and uh, feel uh, very strongly um, these various emotions about it. But, you know, that's the whole glory of it. Every individual listener can come to the music and accept it uh, for what it is. I see it really as a um, almost so intense and personal that uh, really all I want to do is just conduct it and, and uh, try not to get in the way of what it's trying to say. <laughs>